Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is a solved one, but it is a murder that took place in Iceland and Iceland is very near and dear to my heart as I just visited there a couple of months ago and it was absolutely spectacular. But one of the things about Iceland that pretty much everybody emphasizes is just how safe it is there. Things like what happened in this case just do not happen, so when I found out about this case, I knew I needed to speak about it. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Native. Those of you who have been watching my channel for quite some time now know that I love Native and their products, one of my favorite being their amazing body washes. When I look for a body wash, I look for something that has simple, clean ingredients that will give me a nice, fresh scent. And that is why I love Native's body washes. Native's body washes give you that luxurious, foamy lather without using the sulfates that other body washes use to make it foamy. Their body washes are also sulfate, folate, and dye-free. They're also made with naturally derived, plant-based, purified, gentle ingredients like citric acid for pH balance to keep your skin ultra happy. I love that their body washes keep me feeling fresh and clean without any of that annoying residue, leaving my skin feeling silky and smooth. The other great thing that I love about Native is their very wide variety of scent choices with new scents being released all of the time. They literally have so many different scents that just when you think you've tried them all, they come out with even more scents all of the time. Whether you like to smell spicy and woodsy or clean and crisp, there is always a scent for everybody. So first, I have this amazing lilac and white tea one, which is one of my absolute favorite scents. This one is more of a subtle and fresh smell while still having that amazing floral sweet smell that I absolutely love. I also have powder and cotton, which is an amazing fresh everyday scent. It smells exactly how you'd expect it to with that amazing powdery smell. This one is called sea salt and cedar, which reminds me of a beach vacation 100%. It reminds me of that classic soapy scent that you have after going to the beach and washing yourself and getting all fresh and clean. I absolutely love this one. Native also has so much more to offer. They have amazing deodorants and toothpastes that I use literally every single day. They also have a new hand and body lotion. You can treat yourself to the ultimate self-care package with their new limited edition scents. Now, normally three body washes go for $27, but if you use my link down in the description box below and use code RACHELSHANNON13, you can get them for $17, which is 40% off. You do not want to miss this amazing deal because it is a limited time offer. So again, make sure you use my code RACHELSHANNON13 to get 40% off of your three pack of their body washes. Also, with my code, you can get 20% off of any deodorant or lotion. Thank you again so much to Native for partnering with me on today's video and for your continued support of my channel. It's because of sponsors like Native that I'm able to keep making these videos and keep spreading these very important stories. With that being said, let's get right into today's case. Now, like I said, this is a case that took place in Iceland. Iceland's language is very, very complicated, and there are a lot of words that are very difficult to pronounce, so I do apologize ahead of time if I do butcher any of these words. When I was in Iceland, I pretty much just avoided saying any of the words, and if I needed help with something, I would like pull up the word and point to it because it's tough. It's tough, let me tell you, but I do apologize in advance if I do mispronounce any of these words throughout this video. Now, as background, Iceland is considered one of the safest countries in the world to live in. It has one of the lowest murder rates in Europe, with only five total murders in 2020 out of their population of just under 400,000 people, and there are years where their murder rate is zero. To add to that, there are only five total prisons in the country and only 140 people are in prison in Iceland as of 2020. And last that I saw, I don't know if this is still true, but when I looked it up, when I went to Iceland, I saw that there were only seven women in prison in the entire country. So that kind of points to how rare crime is in this country. 
it's so safe that it's considered normal for women to be out and walking around at night and sometimes even accept rides to different places from strangers. There is such a small amount of people in this country that chances are if you don't know the person next to you, you probably know somebody who knows them. It's not necessarily a place where everyone knows everybody, but there is this strong sense of community since there are so little people out there. A lot of people will just do things out of the kindness of their hearts for their fellow human, so that just kind of points to what kind of country this is. Out of their population, about 120,000 of them live in their big city, Reykjavik. It's similar to other Nordic places like Alaska, where in the winter there is a very limited amount of sunlight. In December and January, there are only about four to five hours per day of daylight. They have very cold, harsh winters and beautiful, moderate summers. Now, Brianna branstad Tatur was born on November 28th, 1996. She grew up in the suburbs of Reykjavik, about a 30-minute walk away from the city. She was described as being vivacious, outgoing, with a great sense of humor and a strong sense of self. She was someone who would make friends with pretty much anybody. She loved getting to know everyone around her, and she loved learning about people from different areas of the world. She wanted to know someone from every nation and visit all of them. She loved music, listening to anything from hip-hop to folk music. Nothing was out of the question for her. She loved going out with friends and going to downtown Reykjavik, which is known for its lively night scene. There is no shortage of fun things to do when you visit Reykjavik. One of the main strips that she liked to go to was around Lagavir. This is an area with a bunch of little boutiques, coffee shops, tourist shops, bars, and restaurants. This is a very common place for young people to go to party at night and live it up. On the evening of Friday, January 13th, 2017, after finishing her day of work, 20-year-old Birna decided to go out to Lagavir to hang out with some of her friends. She went to the pub that she often visited with her friends, and there they played cards, doing so until around midnight. This was something that they commonly did. They would go to this pub and just play card games until around midnight, because after midnight is when people usually start dancing and clubbing. So, of course, that night, they stayed out late to party. That night, Birna was dancing the night away. She was up on the stage at a local club and music venue called Hira. However, by the time 2 a.m. rolled around, the friend said that they wanted to go home and call it a night. But Birna was not ready to leave. She told her friends that she wanted to stay until last call. The friends would later say that they didn't necessarily know what she had planned on doing that night, but she loved dancing, so it wasn't out of the question for her to want to stay later. She stayed for about another three hours before she left the club, just before closing time. She started walking home, stopping to buy a falafel pita, before continuing down the street towards her dad's house, where she was living at the time. This was about a 30-minute walk, but once again, this was a very safe area. It was a very brightly lit street with activity almost constantly, and there are CCTV cameras all around the city. Now, she did have a former long-distance boyfriend from Salt Lake City, Utah, who she had met there when he was on vacation there. The two had broken up, but they stayed very amicable because the only reason they broke up is because they decided they didn't want to do, like, this long-distance thing, but they were still friends. Either way, he said that with him being from the U.S., he would always warn Birna against walking alone at night, but she always insisted. She was from Iceland, a very safe area where it was common for anybody, including women, to walk home alone at night, so she did just that. At this time, it was about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. She was seen walking down the street wearing black boots, black jeans, a gray sweater, and a black jacket over that. She definitely was not bundled up, but I'm sure with being Icelandic, she was very used to being cold. Either way, she was captured on CCTV footage making this walk. In the video, we can see that she clearly looks intoxicated. She's sort of staggering around and she bumped into a couple of strangers who just briefly looked at her and then went about their business. 
Then the next camera that picked her up was about a block later. She continues walking until she walks off the camera and is not seen again. In this video, it's clear that she doesn't look uncomfortable. She isn't like holding herself like she's cold or anything like that. She doesn't look scared and she doesn't look like she's bothered by anything. However, after that, Birna was not seen again. That next morning, Birna had a shift where she worked at the Hag Cup department store, but she did not show. Pretty much right away, when she didn't show up to work, her friend Maria, she was very concerned. She knew that Birna would never just not show up to work without telling anybody. Maria and Birna had actually been close friends since elementary school. So, when Birna didn't show up to work, Maria attempted to call her cell phone, but she learned that it was either turned off or it was dead. Again, this immediately raised a red flag for Maria because her phone was never turned off, it was always charged, and she would always answer the calls or text messages that she got, so this was definitely a red flag for her. So, Maria started calling around to the friends that she had been with the night before to see if any of them knew where she was, but nobody had seen her after they left the bar that night. Then, Maria called her dad, who, again, she lived with at the time, to see if she had made it home that night, but once again, she hadn't. Then, she went ahead and called Birna's mother and told her that nobody had seen Birna since the night before. At this point, Birna's mother knew that she was a very outgoing, confident young woman who was very independent, but she was also responsible and reliable. Birna always let her mother or her father know where she was going to be and when she was going to be home. So, immediately, Birna's mother knew that something had to be up. So, she filed a missing persons report for Birna pretty much right away. Then, she took to Facebook with posts saying that Birna hadn't returned home, talking about how out of character this is for her daughter. They said that it's just not like her for her to be out this long and they were starting to get very worried because they weren't able to reach her. She wanted to do whatever she could to spread the word and get as many people as possible looking for her daughter. That night, now going into Saturday, January 14th, the Facebook post had gained quite a bit of traction. People were out there, they were looking for Birna, and her mother stayed up all night waiting to hear from her. She also called around to local emergency services or hospitals for any updates on her whereabouts. Sometimes she was even calling every half hour but there was no word about her. By 9 a.m. the following day, Sunday, January 15th, police told her family that they were able to obtain her cell phone records. It turned out that at 5.50 a.m. on January 14th, that is when her phone was turned off or it had died. But before her phone was shut off, they saw that her phone pinged off of a tower in an industrial area in Hafnafter, which is a port town around six miles south of Reykjavik. This was an area that Birna had no connection to. She didn't know anybody there, she didn't know anybody who worked there, and so she didn't have any reason to be there. So, of course, once the family found out about this, they actually went to the area and started knocking on doors and searching for Birna. People who lived in the area, obviously they didn't know Birna, but they did come out to help her family search for her. Everybody in the community wanted to find this missing young woman, but once again, there was no sign of her. By that Monday, the news media picked up her case, and it would be an understatement to say that people were absolutely shocked, and they were very invested in trying to find her. The main detective on her case was Detective Grimmer Grimson. When he first learned of her disappearance, he was not convinced right away that something was wrong. In his 30 years of being a detective, people are reported missing all of the time. Most of the time, it turns out to be someone who went missing on a hike because there's so many different hikes around Iceland. There's so many different, you know, things to do in nature. So, a lot of times, people would go missing on a hike. 
people with mental health problems like Alzheimer's would go missing, or it would always be young people running away from their homes. Sometimes it was even a case of a young girl sleeping over at a friend's house and not telling her parents. That is something that definitely could have been the case with Birna because, you know, she loved sleeping over at friends' houses. She may not have told her parents or forgot to tell her parents. That's something that definitely could have happened to her. At this point, there was no evidence of foul play and they really had no reason to believe that she had been a victim of any sort. And like I said, I keep emphasizing it throughout this video. Things like this just don't happen in Iceland. So, that is the impression that they were going off of when they started this investigation. But either way, as the days passed and she still was not returning home, police did go ahead and search through the CCTV cameras that showed where she was walking until nothing captured her again. It was thought that after she was last seen on these cameras, she had probably taken a side street or she got into a passing vehicles. I will note that there aren't as many CCTV cameras in Iceland as there are in other areas of Europe because it's such a safe area with such low crime and people there kind of police themselves and will report if they see anything out of the ordinary and things like that. So, that is one reason why she may not have been captured on surveillance video when she actually disappeared. Upon further examination of the surveillance video, police noticed that there was a small red car, a Kia Rio, that had passed Birna traveling in the opposite direction. It had driven past her less than 30 seconds after she disappeared on camera. So, they thought that maybe she could have gotten into this car after she was last seen on the video. However, of course, the video was too grainy to see a license plate number or anything like that, so they weren't initially able to identify who this car belonged to. They also tried looking up every red Kia Rio in the country, but there were way too many leads to follow up on with each person. Helping with the search for Birna was a team of volunteers called Ice SAR, who usually spent their time searching for missing persons due to weather conditions and their sprawling natural landscape, rather for people who may have fallen victim to a crime but nonetheless, they were helping with the efforts to search for Birna. So, members of this team decided to go down to that industrial area where her phone pinged in Hafnafter to see if she was there. There was actually this fenced-off area that had three large oil tanks as well as just a big patch of littered building supplies pretty much everywhere. They decided to search this area and there they found a pair of black boots. They were thought to have been the same pair that Birna was wearing when she went missing. So, they deployed divers to search the cold, icy waters around the harbor. They also used helicopters as well as cadaver dogs to search the area as well. Then they decided to look at the surveillance video that was in this area around the harbor as well. And on this video, they saw that at about 6 a.m. on Saturday, January 14th, there was a red Kia Rio entering the harbor. They saw the car park along a fishing trawler called the Polar Nanak, which had a sail that had Greenland's flag on it. Then they saw that a man who appeared intoxicated got out of the passenger side of the car and then walk up to the ship and get on, and then the car drove off. This time, thankfully, they were actually able to make out a license plate number. This car was actually a rental vehicle. They found out that the car had been rented to someone who worked on that fishing boat, the Polar Nanak. This turned out to be a 25-year-old man from Greenland named Thomas Olsen. It turned out that Thomas had rented this car and then returned it back on Saturday at around noon. However, right after returning it, both him and the other unidentified man who had gotten out of the passenger seat had both boarded the boat and the boat had taken off. So, they were long gone from Iceland at this point. After returning the car, it was actually rented out again to a young family. Of course, police were able to track down this car and took it into their impound lot for examination. 
When examining the car, it was obvious that the car had been recently cleaned, which you can kind of expect for a rental car. But they actually found out that the son of the family who had rented the car was actually complaining of how strong the chemical smell in the car was after it had been cleaned, which was not normal for these rental cars. Then, after looking more closely, police actually noticed that there were trace amounts of blood in the back seat of the car. They took a sample of the blood and sent it off to a forensic lab in Sweden to be tested for DNA to see if it was a match for Birna. As this was happening, Thomas and this unidentified man were sailing along the coast of Iceland and were traveling hundreds of miles away on this fishing boat. Those around him said that after they set sail, he seemed like his normal, happy, easygoing self. However, it had been reported in a local Iceland newspaper that the polar nanak may be linked to Birna's disappearance. Well, there was a reporter who found out about this connection, and they actually found out that Thomas was on the crew, and they sent him a message, I believe on Facebook or something like that, asking him if he knew anything about someone who rented a red Kia Rio. This really freaked him out. He showed the message to his captain and his crewmates, and they all basically told him that if he didn't do anything wrong, then he has nothing to worry about. But him having this reaction and him sort of freaking out, it still concerned the captain on the boat. Now, of course, with the ship heading away from Iceland and the fact that this was a ship, an entity that was owned by Greenland, Iceland police thought that they would have a very tough time getting the jurisdiction to track down this boat and search it. The boat had already been heading towards Norway for their next stop at this point. But the captain of this ship, when he found out that one of his crew members may be linked to this disappearance, he actually turned around the boat and headed back towards Iceland. If only, you know, business owners in the U.S. were this concerned for their fellow man or woman and, you know, said, screw the money, we're going to go back because one of my crewmates may be involved in this. I just don't see that as something happening in the U.S., Sorry, but I think we're way too capitalistic for that. But anyways, that is what they did. After turning back, the captain told the crew that there was actually a problem with the engine and that they needed to head back. He also turned off the Wi-Fi on board so that, you know, whoever was involved was not going to be able to see the news about what was going on because, you know, people were reporting about this. People were reporting that there are two crew members who are thought to be involved and that, you know, the ship is coming back and that they're going to be investigated. As that was happening, six members of the counter-terror unit in Iceland called the Viking Squad deployed a helicopter to meet up with the polar Nanak as it crossed into Icelandic waters. The weather was rough and the waves were very choppy, but once they made contact, they deployed into the ship and waited on the ship's deck. They rowed back on the boat for 12 hours as it headed back to the harbor in Iceland. At the same time, the harbor was being taped off to keep the public out. By now, the news was spreading and people around Iceland were very worried. They weren't used to any sort of crime happening like this one, and they had so much empathy for Birna's family. Everyone in the area wanted them to know that they weren't alone, and they were going out there and doing what they could to help them search for their daughter. But obviously, because of everybody coming out and trying to search and trying to put in the effort, this could cause some problems for, you know, the investigation, so obviously they needed to block things off to make sure that things weren't being messed with by the public. The ship arrived back to the harbor by 11 p.m. that Wednesday, January 18th. By this point, the ship had been able to identify the two men that they believed were responsible for Birna's disappearance. They knew that 25-year-old Thomas Olsen, as well as his crewmate Nikolaj Olsen, they were the ones who rented that red Kia Rio. Now, these two men have the same last name and they're both from Greenland, but they are not related. They found out that Nikolaj was the one who was in the car with Thomas on the day that Birna went missing. 
So as the ship pulled up, Thomas and Nikolaj were cuffed as soon as they walked off of the boat. There were also two other men who were questioned about the disappearance, but they were released immediately. All signs were pointing towards Thomas and Nikolaj. Now, just to pause for a minute and describe each man, I wasn't able to find a ton about each of them, but Thomas Olson was described as being easygoing, outgoing, and sociable. He enjoyed practicing mixed martial arts and had a girlfriend back in Greenland, though he did not have any children or anything like that. Nikolaj, on the other hand, is described as very reserved and impressionable. He seems to be a bit socially awkward, and he looks up to others who are more outgoing than he is. I'm kind of the same way. I like to be around people that are more outgoing than I am because they can make all the friends that I can then hang out with. But either way, he seemed to have a good relationship with his family, and he also had a girlfriend back in Greenland, and he is a little bit older than Thomas. We don't know his exact age, but we know he's not quite 30, but he's older than 25. As soon as they got off that ship, they were taken into questioning, being placed in two separate rooms, and interrogated separately. Both men denied having anything to do with Birna's disappearance, or of harming her in any way. However, police noted right away that Thomas had scratches all over his chest. So, the initial parts of the two men's stories started off pretty similar, but Nikolaj's accounts of the night were pretty foggy. Now, they said that the Polar Nanak had arrived in Iceland on January 11th, 2017, and they were there to pick up other crew members. They said that on a Friday, January 13th, a few of the men on board decided to drive over to Reykjavik for a night on the town. First, Nikolaj took a taxi over to Lagivir, and then Nikolaj said that he wandered around for a bit before ending up at a local pub. He did this thing where you pay an amount that translates to 18 US dollars in order to spin a wheel, and I did the same thing when I was in Iceland. There, he won the grand prize, which was eight free beers. After this, he drank alone while messaging with Thomas online, asking him when he was going to show up. Thomas drove over the rental car a bit after that to the pub, but by the time he showed up, he said that Nikolaj was already pretty drunk. So the two men moved on to another bar described as an American bar, and the two continued drinking heavily. After that, Nikolaj says that he doesn't remember much about the night because of how heavily he had been drinking. After that, they ended up driving on that street where their car was seen on CCTV footage right after Birna went missing. Both of these men said that Birna and actually another woman got into the back of the car at that point. So now they were both driving with two women, but they said that Nikolaj had actually fallen asleep as they were driving back to the harbor. Nikolaj said that he couldn't even really describe the women that were in the car because of how drunk he was. Thomas said that he dropped Nikolaj off at the harbor shortly after 6 a.m. and then he parked in the back of the harbor. Then he climbed into the back seat of the Kia Rio with the two women. He said at this point, him and Birna had started kissing. And he said that's pretty much all that happened before he drove out of the harbor and dropped both women off at a roundabout about an hour after he dropped off Nikolaj. So based on the story that the two men told, police did believe that Nikolaj probably truly was as drunk as they described. They saw him getting out of the car on the CCTV footage and then getting onto the boat. They saw that in this footage, he did look very intoxicated, so that matched up. However, Thomas's story, on the other hand, was not matching up. Now, he was seen driving away from the harbor at 7 a.m. that morning after having entered at 6 a.m. That part is true and does line up. However, at this point, his cell phone data showed that his phone had been turned off and it stayed off for four hours. The only other CCTV footage that saw this red Kia Rio was at a nearby golf course. However, it was described that as soon as the person in the car saw that there was a CCTV camera, the car was seen speeding off. 
It was also after going to the golf course that Birna's phone had also been shut off. The car wasn't seen again until 11 a.m. when it then returned back to the harbor. When confronted with this, he said that after dropping Birna off, he had slept in the car for those four hours. However, the odometer on the car showed that he had actually driven quite a few miles. So, using that, police went and looked at other local surveillance videos, and that is when they actually picked up Thomas shopping at a local grocery store. Here, he is seen buying some Ajax cleaning soap as well as clothes and a plastic bag. Then, CCTV footage from the parking lot saw him going inside of the car and scrubbing the inside of it completely clean. When asked about this, Thomas said that Birna had thrown up in the back of the car and he was trying to clean up from the vomit. However, as we know from before, there were traces of blood found in the backseat of the car. And now, police did have the results of that DNA test from the blood that they found in the rental car. And of course, it was a match to Birna. Now, Thomas did have a past criminal history in Greenland, which included possession of illegal drugs. However, when police searched the ship's tugboat, they found that there were 23 kilograms of hashish blocks on the boat worth around 2 million US dollars. So, it was suspected that Thomas was one of the men involved in attempting to smuggle these drugs. There were also, I believe, three other men arrested in connection with this aspect of smuggling. It was said that when the tugboat was in Denmark, it separated from the main ship, and that is when Thomas was able to place the drugs on board before they made its way back to Iceland and docked at the same harbor, but it is thought that this crime is in no way related to Birna in any way. But police did find something else that was very damning. Police found Birna's driver's license folded and thrown away in the ship's trash can. Upon further forensic examination, Thomas's fingerprint was found on this driver's license. Then, going back to the shoe that they found at the harbor, the black boot, again, was confirmed as belonging to Birna, and further examination found that Thomas's DNA was on the lace of her shoe. Now, by this point, police knew that Thomas had to have something to do with Birna's disappearance, even though he was continuing to deny any involvement. But they hadn't found her body, and they were absolutely determined to find her. So, on the morning of January 21st, a week after her disappearance, police launched the largest search operation in Iceland's history. They deployed over 500 members of the ICE SAR, members of the National Guard, 835 volunteers, 87 vehicles, and any other resources that they could to set out in the search for Birna. That first day, they searched along the southern peninsula, their lava fields, as well as their frozen lakes, but they found nothing. However, the following day, Sunday, January 22nd, their searches came to an end. They had deployed a Coast Guard helicopter that was flying very low along the coastline near the Selvagsleviti lighthouse along the south coast. I do apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. This is an area where there are a bunch of large black stones with debris from the ocean of ships that have passed by. Near the water's icy edge, an officer on the helicopter found something that looked out of place, and of course, when they looked closer, they discovered that this was Birna's body. Birna's body had been found naked, however, according to her autopsy, she was found with no evidence of sexual assault. It showed that she had been struck in the face and strangled. Police believed that this happened while back at the harbor, after Thomas was seen entering the back of his car. However, it showed that Birna was still alive when she was thrown into the water. Her cause of death was labeled as the result of drowning. After this gruesome discovery was made, the people of Iceland were just horrified, and so were the people of Greenland. No one wanted this to be the result of the searches. They held her funeral at the country's biggest church. They had over 2,000 people show up, 
including the president and the prime minister, all show up to mourn Birna's devastating death. Crew members from the Polar Nanak were also devastated with this discovery and the entire situation. One member made a statement, which was translated from Greenlandic to English. It reads, quote, This event has touched us deeply. We, the crew of the Polar Nanak, would like to send our deepest condolences to the family of Birna. We hope that it will be possible to inform about the sequence of events as soon as possible so that the perpetrators can be brought to justice. We, the crew, have been greatly traumatized by the events of the last few days. It has been difficult for us to understand how to react to various things. For example, Birna's family has asked us to explain Birna's disappearance, but we have been forbidden to communicate externally and we have not known what happened. We are grateful for being able to care for each other and for the support of our families and employers. The ship's crew and I, who have now gathered in one town in Iceland, boarded the ship directly upon arrival in Iceland on Saturday, January 14th. It is important for us to state that we are in Iceland for our work. Many thoughts have crossed our minds and it is important for us to say that there are one or two individuals who are suspected of having committed the act and we and our nation cannot take responsibility for such horrible events. They will be hard to forget. It has been difficult for us to be a part of these terrible events and some of us have had to go back home. We are very grateful to have received care from a psychologist and from volunteers and we hope to be able to return to our work and daily life. In these sad and difficult times, we would like to point out that Icelanders' attitudes towards us has not changed and is as warm as before. Now, police believe the story that Nikolaj was not involved. There was no evidence against him being present when this crime was committed. However, there was plenty of evidence against Thomas even though he would not admit to what he did. By March 30th, 2017, Thomas Olson was charged with drug possession and murder. The trial for murder started in August of 2017. The prosecution had a pretty good case against Thomas. They had the blood in the car that matched Birna's DNA. They had the CCTV footage that showed him everywhere he went that day. They had her driver's license with Thomas's fingerprint on it in the trash. They also found his DNA on her boot. They also brought Nikolaj forward to testify about what he saw happen that night. In the trial, Thomas admitted to the drug possession, but he would not say that he was responsible for Birna's death. During the trial, he actually told a new story. He said now that only Birna had gotten into the car that night. Remember, like I said from before, he said that there were two women who got into the car that night, but now he's saying that only Birna did. I have no idea why he tried to say that two women were in the car to begin with, but that is what he said, and now this is what he is changing it to. He said that he was just innocently driving along when Birna just suddenly climbed into the back of his car. As they were driving, Thomas said that he stopped along the road to take a quick pee, and that is when Nikolaj drove the car off with Birna still inside. Thomas said that he, I guess, just waited there in the same spot for quite some time before Nikolaj returned back to pick him up, but now, Birna was no longer in the car. However, Nikolaj said that he didn't have a driver's license, nor had he ever learned how to drive a car. He said that it's very unlikely that he would have driven the car the entire night. He also said that in his condition with how drunk he was that night, he is confident that there would have been an accident if he drove that car. Now, Nikolaj was so drunk that he couldn't point out Birna as being the person who got in the car, but he did remember that there was a woman in the car that night. He remembers that before he was dropped off back at the boat, Nikolaj asked Thomas what he was going to do with the girl, and Thomas said that he was going to take care of her and drive her somewhere. That, along with the story that we discussed earlier, he said is all he remembers about that night. Of course, the court was not believing Thomas's made-up story. They were actually more so surprised that Thomas would have the goal to try and pin this murder on his crewmate to begin with. So, with all of the evidence that was presented about a month after the trial started, 
three judges convicted Thomas on both charges of drug possession and murder, and he was sentenced to serve 19 years behind bars. The aftermath of this case obviously left the entire country in shock. Of course, her family was devastated, and so was her community. This kind of thing just doesn't happen in Iceland, and it was said that if you asked almost any Icelander after this happened, they would tell you that something in them shifted. We still don't know why she got in the car that night, but the assumption, at least by me, is that they probably offered her a ride. I think that Thomas picked up Birna with the intention of bringing her back to the boat maybe to hook up with him. I think he dropped Nikolaj off at the boat, hoping that once him and Birna were alone, that she would hook up with him. I think that once he got into the back of the car and tried to hook up with her, she denied his advances. I think that she fought back and in the heat of the moment, he hit her and then strangled her. I think she was unconscious at that point and he thought, oh crap, I just killed her, but as we know, she was still alive according to the autopsy. But again, I do think that he thought that she was dead. I think that during those four hours that he is completely unaccounted for, that is when he drove over to the area where her body was found and dumped her there. Then he cleaned the car of any evidence that he could. Then he returned the car and then returned back to the ship like nothing happened. That is what I personally think happened. But like I said, this was a case that affected just about everybody in Iceland. Everybody said that they will always remember this case. Each and every person said that their sense of security has changed after this situation. Young women in particular are much more careful and a lot of women had realized that they need to look after one another. It was common for people to catch a ride with strangers before this, but not after. Something that was cool that happened after this was that there was a Facebook group created that was made for giving each other rides, but it was a female-only type of thing, so that sort of just added a little bit of security for women in the city who needed rides to get around and things like that. Birna's family is now just dedicated to keeping Birna's memory alive. Her mother wears a necklace with her photo on it, and there's a whole wall in their home dedicated to Birna. I can't even imagine just how much of an effect this had on everybody involved, everybody who knew her, everybody who knew of her. It affected the entire country, which is just insane to me. I wanted to cover this case because I wanted to highlight that even in a country on this tiny island in the middle of the ocean with absolutely no crime, things can still happen. We still need to look out for one another and we still need to do whatever we can to keep each other safe. My heart absolutely goes out to Birna, her family, her friends, and everybody else who loved her. I do wish that Thomas got more of a hefty prison sentence, but again, since this type of thing really does not happen in Iceland, I can see that that being why they don't have more harsh punishments because they just aren't used to this type of thing like we are, unfortunately, in the US. I hope that Thomas lives every single day knowing that his disgusting and despicable actions have affected the lives of thousands of people and I hope that her family knows that Birna's life meant so much to so many people. But that is where I'm going to end today's case. Now I want to know what you guys think. Do you agree with what I had to say about how I think all of this happened? Or do you think that Thomas just went there and he picked her up with the intention to kill her? Let me know your thoughts on this and anything else that you think in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you also head to Native using the link that I have listed down below and use code RACHELSHANNON13 for 40% off of your set of three body washes. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over using the Google form that I have listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.